Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Straight Science. Straight Science is an evening science presentation series put on by UAF Northwest Campus here in Nome, and also UAF Alaska Sea Grant, and you're in the home office tonight. So UAF Northwest Campus and UAF Alaska Sea Grant, we are public servants of the Bering Strait region, and we serve all peoples of the Bering Strait region, which is the homeland and waters of the Inupiaq, Central Yupik, and St. Lawrence Island peoples. So tonight we've got UAF in the house. That's very exciting for us. Uh, we've got Alex Sletten. Sletten. Yeah. Okay. And she is with the, she's been going to school, getting her master's degree. And what we're going to see tonight is the really the newest information hot off the, the UAF-ness of her master's degree. She has been working with the College of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences. And Lara Horstman is here uh, listening in. So we'll, we know she's going to give us a good, uh, good uh, speech here, Alex. And... It's a tough topic tonight. Oh, and I want to mention Alex also works for the Alaska Department. There we go. Alaska Department of Fish and Game for the Marine Mammal Program in Fairbanks. And she has done her work looking at the spotted seal stomachs from Gamble and Shishmaref. And this is not going to be an easy topic, I think, for the Bering Street region to hear about. But we, and there's a lot of those, a lot of topics we're having trouble hearing and learning about trying to wrap our head around all that's happening to us, but we need to learn about them. And so um, I'm, I'm very interested to find out and hear from you what you've learned. And also um, Alex has said, hold off on questions until the end, unless you're the caller. Callers always have priority in straight science. And uh, we can talk more in depth with those questions. And I'm sure there'll be questions about spotted seals and, uh, and, and uh, the results that Alex is about to share with us. So thank you so much. And Alex, we're really glad you're here. Take it away on microplastics in our spotted seals. All right. Thank you so much, Gabe, for that introduction and for inviting me to come and speak with you today. Um, I am so pleased with the turnout and I can't wait to share my research with you and answer any questions that you may have on this topic. Um, and that topic is microplastics in spotted seal stomachs from the Bering and Chukchi Seas in 2012 and 2020. And as um, Gay mentioned, this is a part of my master's thesis and I am set to graduate um, next month. So this is pretty much the end of it for it. Um, but that doesn't mean that that's the end of microplastic work for Alaska. I feel like it's rather the beginning. So let's go ahead and dive right in. In theory. So what are microplastics? Microplastics are simply just small pieces of plastic that have broken down over time. Um, and it's often a byproduct of plastic manufacturing and its waste and disposal. To be a microplastic, it must be less than five millimeters in length. Um, this size is very small and it's often not visible to the naked eye. And if you look at these two images on the right here, and I apologize for the, the callers on, on this uh, session, um, there's just some really small look like little um, fibers and, and maybe like just lines on them. They're super magnified at 40 times magnification. Um, so these are just not visible to the naked eye and that's why we have to use a microscope to detect these a lot of time. And microplastics come in three main size classifications. They can be fibers, such as the ones on the screen, um, fragments, so they're kind of irregular shaped, or beads, um, just really small um, uh, spheres basically. Um, microplastics are considered a ubiquitous contaminant, meaning that they're found worldwide. Um, they've been detected from the tops of the Alps to the bottom of the Mariana Trench to sea ice in um, the Southern Ocean, um, just all over the world. There really isn't a habitat that they haven't been finding this in. So now that we kind of know what it's defined as, I'd like to talk about how it's, um, how it's formed and how it enters the environment. So microplastics can be classified as primary or secondary. Primary microplastics are those that when they're created and, and designed and, and manufactured, they're already at that size classification. So examples of this could be, you know, a facial cleanser or a scrub that you're using um, and those little beads inside the, the lotions are actually microplastics. 
A secondary microplastic is something like a, a water bottle that's actually broken down and eroded over time and little pieces of plastic have actually broken off and entered the environment that way. Um, so that would be a secondary microplastic. Secondary microplastics can be formed uh, through mechanical wear, such as a vehicle tire driving on the road and that abrasion actually rubbing those polymers off the tire. It can be weathering, such as a bottle of water sitting on the beach that's getting hit by tides, or it could be microorganisms, which is just the bacterial degradation of plastics. Um, and as you can see, my, um, plastics and microplastics are used in everyday life and they can enter the waterways through various mechanisms. So there's a figure on the left here where it shows sources of primary and secondary microplastics and how they actually end up into our waterways. So if we take those um, personal cosmetic products, so your lotions and your soaps that have um, plastics in them, as you're at the sink washing your face, that water actually collects into the drain and it moves to the nearest wastewater uh, treatment facility. Um, most wastewater treatment facilities don't have um, filtration set up to actually filter out this size particle. And so what it does is it makes its way through the filtration and into the discharge into the nearest waterways. And from there, you know, it enters the big rivers and the rivers feed into the ocean. And that's kind of how it ends up there. Another example would be textiles. So that synthetic, you know, winter coat or, or um, nice shirt, you know, as you wash it in the washing machine, all, um, plastic particles will actually um, slough off the material of that um, of the clothing and it will get stuck in your washing machine. And then the same thing happens as that washing machine drains water, it will go through that wastewater treatment facility and into the river. So we kind of talked about how it originates on land and then from there it moves to the ocean. Um, so there um, is multitude of ways that plastics can enter the ocean. We just talked about the river sources, um, but it can also be deposited in the atmosphere. So microplastics are very light um, and they can be easily carried with the wind and deposited it to, this, to the surface of the ocean. And then of course, you also have the at-sea pollution from fishing gear and equipment um, where plastic can just um, wear off over time. And once it's in the water, it's rather subjected to the ocean's uh, circulation system. So the water masses, they're in constant motion. It takes many years to actually, you know, navigate around the, the globe. And while it's in this circulation belt, um, it can be, it can have any number of fates, such as actually sinking to the bottom. It can be ingested by various organisms. Um, it can um, actually aggregate, um, form these large, um, clusters of plastics, which makes them even more dense and more susceptible to falling into the sediment. And then here in the sediment, they'll actually accumulate over time until it's disturbed. And some things that could disturb sediments, uh, especially within Arctic regions could be upwelling. So um, especially in areas like St. Lawrence Island has a area of massive upwelling. Um, it could also just be from, you know, a walrus or a bearded seal coming by and moving that sediment around looking for food. And that actually ends up resuspending these microplastics, and then they can re-enter that ocean circulation pattern. And eventually over time, this pattern will take them from anywhere in the world and up to the Arctic as the water circulates. And once it's in the Arctic, the Arctic is unique for many reasons. The primary reason obviously being the amount of sea ice um, that dominates the ocean during certain months of the year. And that seasonality of the sea ice as it um, expands and retreats um, year round is that it can move plastics around. So as ice is forming and expanding, any plastics that are in the water can actually be incorporated into that ice matrix and stored over time. So as the ice moves with microplastics trapped in it, it could potentially deposit microplastics into other areas of the Arctic as it melts. And this makes uh, sea ice a great sink source and vector of microplastics, um, just depending on the time of year and where it's at. Another feature that's kind of dominant with the Alaska coastal area is the uh, very large continental shelves. And you can see that here with the red coloration on this map. And that just shows that that water depth is, is rather shallow. And when you have shallow waters like this, it promotes that sedimentation. So those microplastics that are in the water and being moved around are more inclined to settle into the sediment where they can be accessed by um, any animal that can dive or in areas of upwelling, it can be resuspended into that water column. 
Also in this region, we have a lot of northward movement of water. Um, so if you're looking at the screen, you can see the arrows of the currents that are moving from Bering Sea um, north through the Strait region into the Chukchi. So you have the Anadir, you have the Bering Shelf, and you have the last coastal current. And all of these um, currents are moving water northward through that strait, and it could potentially be gearing any kind of plastics into the region. Um, within the Alaska coastal area, they've tested the water column, um, sea ice, uh, beaches, and sediment of the oceans, and found microplastics in all of those environments within the Arctic. So now that we know that plastics are in the environment and how they get there, um, how they move through the food web and into seals, which we'll get to, um, is through this food web and how it, and microplastics have the capability of bioaccumulating and biomagnifying. Bioaccumulating is um, simply an animal that lives for a long period of time. It just is continually ingesting things like microplastics and it can potentially build up in its system throughout its lifetime. Biomagnification occurs as, an org as a contaminant such as microplastics moves up that food web. So if you look at this food web on the left, you can see that on the bottom here is the plankton, um, the small organisms, the base of the food web. And those get eaten by other um, lower trophic level crustaceans such as amphipods and maybe some shrimp. And then there's um, some, above that, there's some mid trophic level fish that will come through and eat those uh, smaller um, amphipods and shrimps. And those will feed into larger fish, which ultimately feeds into that top predator, which is where we often see many of our ice seals here in Alaska. So as they're moving up this food web, they have to eat more and more food to sustain their met metabolic demands. And so this can magnify the amount of uh, microplastics that are, are being consumed as you move up that food web. Microplastics for animals are often um, they enter the body through ingestion and through consuming food and prey. But there can also be instances of accidental ingestion, um, such as um, a fish just swimming through the water and breathing and you know, it can get caught in the gills. Or if an organism mistakes a piece of plastic for food, it could just eat it on accident, not realizing what it's doing. And then once an organism has, has ingested a microplastic, there's any number of fates that could happen. It could get caught and stuck in that GI tract for a long period of time. It could be excreted as waste or potentially even absorbed into the body. And once it enters the body, there's a wide range of health hazards that could occur. So as you see this picture here on the right, um, it's simply um, examples of plastics and that can be used um, in everyday life, as well as the recycling number. So if you ever you know, picked up a bottle of soda, it probably has a number on the bottom and that just tells you what the main component is and if it's recyclable. And if it is recyclable, how you can recycle it. Um, but what this doesn't really capture, what doesn't really portray to the public is that um, not all of these are truly recyclable. Many of these plastic materials are cons consist of um, persistent bioaccumulative toxins, and these chemicals are added to plastics and give them specific properties. Um, whether that could be the, the color, um, you know, the plasticity of it, like or how much it could bend. Um, you know, how well it can break down, or how, how tough it is, any of these um, characteristics that a manufacturer needs its products to adhere to can determine what chemicals it uses or additives. And um, there's over 10,000 different chemicals that can be used in the construction of plastic. Over 2,400 of those are considered PBTs or persistent bioaccumulative toxins um, that have potential health implications for um, during the ingestion of these. Um, and these, these uh, chemicals, these harmful chemicals can cause um, various health effects to uh, ingestion, including um, affecting the endocrine system or the hormone production of organs, or organisms and how they, um, their reproductive success. Um, and in this example here on the left, you can see that they found that in individuals with liver disease actually had an increased risk of microplastics accumulating in their liver. Um, they've done many laboratory-based studies, including some on um, mice, and found that microplastic uh, consumption actually led to um, issues such as um, central nervous depression, uh, system depression, uh, neurotoxicity, it affected their ability to reproduce and look for food and just caused a lot of health issues for those mice. 
And um, uh, that was a laboratory-based study, um, which is a limitation for a lot of this right now, but um, it's definitely something that needs to be looked at. So with Alaska um, and Alaskan based examples, um, the first one would be um, gray whales. So they did a study looking at pregnant gray whales and they were able to estimate that gray whales when they're pregnant or lactating will actually consume between six and a half and 21 million microplastics a day. So uh, a really insane large amount of microplastics um, due to that increased uh, metabolic demand while they're um, developing a fetus. Um, with whales and seals, uh, a recent study um, by Greg Morrell showed that they found microplastics in the blubber, acoustic fat pads, melons, and lungs of uh, several different species of whales and seals. And then with Alaska pollock, they found that um, as the pollock grew um, in age and size, that there was increased microplastics. And that's kind of shown here on this image to the right. And again, I apologize for the, the, the phone attendees today. Um, but you can see on this top panel A over here that you have your abundance of microplastics per individual um, and then the age of the fish. And as you can see, the age as the fish gets older, they have more and more microplastics found in their stomachs. Um, and then here you can see that same um, relationship, but um, more on a, on a graph with the average. And then here on um, in the lower left-hand corner, the only difference here is that um, it, instead of a number of plastics is the concentration. So how many plastics per gram of the, of the fish and it's also increases with age. Um, and now I'd like to transition to spotted seals, um, the focus species uh, for my project. So the spotted seal is an ice associated seal. This means it relies on the sea ice for at least some part of its um, life history strategies. Um, they are the least ice adapted uh, species compared to the ring seals and bearded seals who actually, ring seals will actually maintain breathing holes in the ice. Um, and spotted seals don't really do that. You know, they follow the sea ice in the winter and they are more co coastal in the summer. Um, but the reason we chose them is because of their, their diet. So they're primarily piscivorous, um, meaning they consume mainly fish. And this puts them at a higher trophic position. And we thought that this would be a good species to start with because of that biomagnification we talked about earlier with that food web. So as the seal is eating uh, prey items at a higher trophic level, they could potentially be ingesting more microplastics. Uh, additionally, the spotted seal has a wide range of in, well, within Alaskan waters, um, south at Bristol Bay, all the way north to the Beaufort Sea. So they cover a wide area um, to represent. Additionally, um, they were found, they're recently found to be near bottom divers. So over 75% um, of their dives uh, in the water are to near bottom depths. And so that kind of gives them exposure to potential exposure to microplastics within the water column, as well as towards the sediment. Um, so again, an, a nice range of possibilities there. They also live to be 35 years of age, which makes them a good model for that bioaccumulation we mentioned that as animals, organisms, um, live longer lives, they can accumulate more contaminants over the course of their life. And then finally, they're a great sentinel species for humans, and they can really indicate that ecosystem health and how things are moving in the ocean. So the goals of my project were kind of twofold. The first one was to just to simply determine if microplastics are present in spotted seal stomachs. And if they were present, we wanted to determine if there was any temporal or spatial differences among age classes. So in particular, we wanted to compare pups Pup, spotted seals and non-pups. And then we also chose two locations, um, at Gamble and the Bering Sea, and then Shishmaref and the Chukchi Sea to see if there was any difference by location. And then we also compared the two years of harvest of 2012 and 2020. So as I mentioned, um, samples were collected at Gamble in, North, in the St. Officer Lawrence Island in the Bering Sea, and then Shishmaref and the Chukchi Sea just north of the Bering Strait. Um, and samples were originated as part of the Alaska Department of Fish and Games um, Arctic Marine Mammal uh, Program, their long-term biomonitoring. So hunters and, and uh, samplers at these communities um, would send uh, tissues in from spe uh, specific seals and um, it allows them to determine the health of the population over time. And as part of that, the jaw is sent in, which allows us to get an age of the seal through counting the cemented layers on the teeth. And we also receive information on data sheets, such as the harvest dates, so we know when it was harvested and the morphological measurements of the seal. So we can kind of determine its body condition. So these samples are received and processed at the laboratory here in Fairbanks. And then once they are given some sample IDs, they're frozen at negative 20 degrees Celsius 
intel analysis. And then that's where I come in and take some stomachs for some analysis. So once I take those stomachs, I um, have to process them in the lab here at the UAF campus. And I'd like to note that for this process, I had to use um, non-plastic equipment to prevent cross-contamination of the samples. Um, and we actually found that um, the water we were using as part of this process, just regular tap water, did have microplastics in it. So in order to prevent adding plastics to the sample and miscounting, we had to pre-filter a bunch of water um, at a 0 0.07 porosity just to remove a lot of those plastics that were in the water so that we weren't contaminating our samples. I also used air blanks placed on the um, surface near the samples at all times to, ca to capture any possible airborne contamination and remove those counts um, to blank correct them. And we used various um, PPE or personal protective equipment such as cotton lab wear and gloves so that we weren't contaminating any of our samples. So once we got the sample into the lab, we first emptied the contents into a basin and weighed them. So we would um, know how much was in each stomach or how much mass was in each stomach. Then we took the, that bin of uh, stomach contents and we actually ran it through a one millimeter sieve. And as you can see in this image here, again, apologies, um, the prey items, the, 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 excuse me, the mass that wasn't just liquid, the solid mass um, stayed on top of the sieve. And then all the liquids actually would filter and we would collect them into a beaker or a basin here at the bottom. And this allowed us to separate out uh, contents by size and, uh, and isolate prey items for this analysis. Then we took that um, beaker there at the bottom and we ran it through a smaller sieve of 0.5 millimeters um, so that we could, um, or excuse me, 0.125 millimeters so that we could um, even get the smaller uh, material out of there. And then all the liquid would just go through. And then once we had those, we were able to um, document any prey items that we found. So you can see in this image here, these are actually just fish bones that were in the stomach. And then the white pieces right there are otoliths, fish otoliths, um, which is ear bone in the fish. And that actually allowed us to identify what species of fish were being eaten by the, by the seal. And you'll see why that's important later on. Um, here you can see some shrimp that were found in a sieve. And so we were able to photograph and document those so that we could identify those species as well. Um, then once the contents were removed from the sieve and documented, we ended up placing them on a freeze dryer as shown here. And this freeze dryer um, removed all the moisture from the samples and was allowed to sit for 24 hours. And this gave us our dry weight. And this dry weight was used to determine how much chemical we needed to add to it. So what we did was we used an enzyme digestion method um, that broke down the contents of the stomach. So you can see in these images here, there's a lot of tissue, tissue parts to the stomach, you know, all that um, uh, shrimp and fish uh, muscle that had to be broken down so that we could see if there was any microplastics. And so we used a series of chemical compounds and an incubator and they um, and added different agents at different points of time. And they just sat in the incubator for five days. And then once we were done with that, we were able to remove them and process them further. So I mentioned that documenting the prey was important. So as we found prey items, we isolated them and stored them in 70% ethanol. Then we were able to separate them by taxonomic groups. So we kind of group up the otoliths and the shrimp and the amphipods um, and things like that. And then we would get a weight on them so we can determine proportions of the diet as well as get a count on them. So we knew how many they had eaten within the previous 12 to 24 hours. Next, we used the microscope at 10 to 26 times magnification to actually identify these items of species. And you see on the image on the left here, these are those fish otoliths that I was showing you about showing earlier. Um, and we are actually able to measure the lengths of these otoliths so that we could determine what size of uh, fish was eaten. So based on that length, we can determine the length of the fish and the weight of the fish. And we use several different taxonomic keys. And uh, if you are looking at this image here on the left, um, there is actually a shrimp pinned in there. And so we would take that carapace there and actually identify that to species as well. So once they come out of the incubator after that chemical process, um, next we had to filter them using vacuum filtration. Um, if there were still some hard parts, um, in particular uh, fish bones were problematic, we ran the contents after they came out of the incubator through another sieve just to remove the fish bones and then took the liquid and filtered it. So you can see that on the image here on the left, this jar here, that's actually what comes out of the incubator uh, minus the fish bones. And then from there, we pour it into this, this funnel system right here. 
And this vacuum filter will take that liquid and go through the, um, this connecting piece right here, which has a filter in it. And that filter will collect all the plastic, potential plastics that are in that sample. And then all the liquid will roll right through. And then that filter is taken and put in a blank glass petri dish, as you see here. And then it's looked at under the microscope at 40 times magnification to any, isolate any microplastics. And that's me here on the right, um, using the scope to look for microplastics on these filters. So moving into the results, we looked at a total of 34 spotted seals for this project. And of those 33 had microplastics in their stomach for a frequency of occurrence of 97%. In total, I found 211 plastic particles, but only 190 of those are, were actually microplastics. The rest were too large to be classified as microplastics. And if you look at this image on the right here, you can see some examples of plastics. Um, so panels A, B, and C will show different fibers. Um, on, and figure D here is the only fragment we found. Um, so we had 190 microplastics and 189 of them were these fiber materials. And uh, again, these aren't visible with the naked eye. It required the use of the microscope. And these are just kind of examples of what they look like. Um, we found between zero and 23 particles per stomach and the concentration um, which is just the number of microplastics per gram of stomach contents, which is why we weighed the stomachs in the beginning. Um, it created the, the range value for um, the concentration. So I mentioned we were identifying all the um, prey items to species. Um, this is how it ended up breaking down. So the most common uh, prey items that were consumed by uh, the seals in the study were Pacific herringfish, rainbow smelt, saffron cod and shrimp. Um, and a lot of these other prey items were just consumed by one or two seals. Um, but herring and smell were the, the two primary um, prey items. So looking at frequency of occurrence, I mentioned that 33 out of the 34 seals had microplastics in their stomach. Um, what, if you remember, one of the goals of the study was to determine if there was any difference between age class of the seal, um, the two different harvesting locations, and then the two years. And as you can see in this figure um, on the slide here, we have frequency of occurrence as a percentage on the uh, y-axis. And then on the x-axis, we have the different comparison groups. We have age, class, harvest location, and harvest year. And you can see that there is no significant difference between any of these comparison groups. So while we found them in most of the seals, it did not vary by how old the seal was, where it was harvested, or when it was harvested. Um, so no, no differences there. Looking at concentration, um, again, this is with uh, the concentration on the y-axis and the different comparison groups here on the x-axis. Um, there was no difference in any of these comparison groups as well. And this, this image is a little bit harder to, to make sense of with all these dots up here, um, but these are just outliers. And what actually is happening here is that, you know, these dots have really high concentration, but what happened is these seals had like the same number of plastics as other seals, but they didn't have any prey items in their stomach. Um, so those empty stomachs actually um, skewed the concentration values because there was less matter to compare it to uh, with, the, with the count of microplastics. Um, but again, no difference in any of those comparisons groups. Next, you can see microplastics that we found by the size and by the color. So this image on the left here shows the size that we were finding. Um, while I was looking at these plastics under the microscope, I um, definitely was measuring all of them to determine that they were microplastics. And what we found was that most of the plastics were in that really small 0.25 millimeter range, um, as you can see here. This red line on the graph is just differentiating the microplastics to the left and then the larger macroplastics to the right. This image on the right here shows the main colors of microplastics that we found. The, main, the predominant color in all of the fibers we saw were black, followed by blue, and clear. Um, next, looking at microplastics by prey species. Again, this is really important because of the trophic position of the spotted seal being really high on that food web. Um, and they eat a lot of this fish. Um, so if you're looking at this image right here, so these are main fish that are consumed by uh, spotted seals. And you'll notice that there's a percentage below three of them. This percentage indicates the amount of fish in previous studies that had microplastics. So in, for instance, in one study, they looked at um, Arctic cod and they, uh, off of Greenland, and they found that 15% of the Arctic cod in the region had microplastics in them. Um, and as you move from left to right on this figure, 
the trophic level of the fish increases. So the capelin are often eaten by the herring, the walleye pollock eat everything else below them. And so as you're moving, they're possibly increasing the amount of food that they need to eat as they're larger. And it also increases the amount of microplastics they could be exposed to. And that also applies to the spotted seal as the spotted seal consumes all of these. But you'll note that the uh, amount of microplastics that have previously been found in these fish species increases with trophic level. And the walleye pollock, 85% um, of the walleye pollock that were tested in the study had microplastics. And um, my, walleye pollock are an important resource, uh, prey resource for spotted seals. Um, and they used to, in a study in 1996, they were found that um, consume walleye pollock uh, at 88% 80, of the time. So it's definitely an important fishery for the spotted seal. Um, in another study off of China, they found that 57% of fish had microplastics, but there was less in crustaceans. And it's, uh, it was a little more challenging for me to make that same conclusion just because only four of the 34 seals in the study actually ate crustaceans. Um, most of the prey items we found were in fact um, fish. So if we look at the microplastics compared to the prey that identified the species, um, we grouped the prey items by benthic and a combination of pelagic and benthic. So benthic prey are prey that live more towards the seafloor. Um, they include things like shrimp and some squid and octopus, some sculpin that hang out at the bottom. And then pelagic um, uh, prey items are those that live more in the water column and move around through the different levels of the water. And so we had a combination group here between pelagic and benthic. So if a seal was eating both fish and um, invertebrates off the bottom, um, then they fell into that pelagic benthic composition. And what we found was when grouping them like this, that spotted seals that were eating mostly um, benthic prey and not pelagic prey, had more microplastics in their stomach. Um, so foraging towards the bottom, you know, it makes sense with the possibility of that sedimentation that we talked about with microplastics on the seafloor. Next, I wanted to compare um, the prey items that were ingested by the spotted seals based on their trophy position, um, looking at that biomagnification of that food web. So for this, um, I used the trophic levels that were determined in previous studies for all of these species. And examples of hydrophic prey eaten by spotted seals in the study was codfish, so saffron cod, arctic cod, um, things like that. And then uh, prey that was considered a low trophic level prey are things like Pacific herring and invertebrates like shrimp and uh, squid. And what we found was is that if the seals were consuming prey um, that were higher trophic level, such as those cod, they had an increased amount of microplastics in their stomach compared to those that were eating you know, shrimp or other small invertebrates. So some conclusions and things that we found as part of the study was, um, well, this was the first study that to uh, directly examine marine mammals um, for microplastics in their stomachs within Alaskan waters. But what it shows is that there's been over a decade of consumption. So these plastics are in the environment, they're in the prey, and seals have been eating them at least since 2012. Um, what they don't know is that, you know, we know that they're eating them, but we don't know how it's being absorbed into the body or if it's being absorbed into the body. Um, and those are two very different things and absorption um, and uptake into the body is definitely the next step to look at. Um, this project did show that we could apply this, these methods to other marine mammals, such as um, ring seals and spotted seals here in Alaska. Um, and these species are all sentinel species for the marine ecosystems. So monitoring these species will help us understand how the ecosystem is doing as a whole. And not only that, all of these ice seals are highly important cultural and subsistence resources and species to Alaska Native communities. Um, and so it's definitely worth looking at. So some big takeaways um, from this whole study um, is that microplastics are not limited to marine mammals. It's definitely a worldwide contaminant. You know, I mentioned that it's in um, the tops of the Alps where people don't live to sea ice. Um, they found uh, sea ice uh, cores. They did some core sampling and found anywhere between 38 and 234 plastic particles per cubic meter. So um, a lot that's trapped in multi-year ice. So it's been there for a long time. And in fact, the average human eats about a credit card of plastic each week. Um, with the top sources of this consumption being from using bottled water, um, eating seafood, and drinking beer of all things. Um, it, it's, uh, it's definitely there and it's definitely being consumed already. 
Um, but the next steps, knowing all of this, is that we need to look at microplastic absorption and accumulation in these uh, seals and tissues, as well as in humans, and just continue monitoring and see how it changes. Um, I mentioned that we could apply the methods to these other species to look at ecosystem as a whole and studying the health effects. And then also, you know, just mitigating our plastic use and pollution um, is only going to help the situation. I'd like to acknowledge a lot of people that helped me with this project, including my academic committee, Laura Horseman is on the call right now, as well as Katrina Ikin and Anna Bryan. Um, I'd really, really like to thank the native village of Gamble and Shishmaref, um, without whose support in Fish and Games um, biomonitoring project, this project would not have been um, even possible. I have uh, let's like thank my Fish and Game uh, staff here, as well as uh, UAF laboratory personnel. Um, Horseman Lab, friends and family. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, funding for this project was primarily provided by um, U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs, as well as some scholarships to the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And at this time, I'd really like to open the floor for questions and discussion and like to hear what you guys think or what you guys would like to know more about. All right. Well, thank you, Alex. Well done. And while, while we're thinking of our questions, I know I've got a couple. And while we're thinking of those, this is a great time to the street science audience is always great. It's it's time to give Alex a little love in the chat box. It is never easy to be a public speaker ever. Honestly, it doesn't matter how old you get. And then you, you get all those butterflies in your stomach or cellophane bits. I don't know at this point uh, in your stomach. So, um, Oh, somebody said beer, say it ain't so. So so let's open it up to questions. We really thank you, Alex, for taking the time to tell us about what you found. That was sobering to me and I've got lots of questions. So um, we'll open it up. Does anyone have any questions right off the bat? And I'll check the chat. Or everyone's stunned trying to figure this out, honestly, what this means. In the chat, okay, there's some questions in the chat. Let me see. Um, Laura asked, thank you, Alex, this was great, agree. What do you think is the significance of color in fibers? We're finding that the majority of microplastics in bowhead four stomach contents, oh, Laura, you're breaking my heart, are also black fibers. Fishing gear, thoughts? Yeah, I, uh, I, I think you're on the right track there, Laura. Um, in a perfect world, I would have had a um, free cost, um, you know, a machine uh, to do some uh, infrared spectroscopy on the fibers that I found to actually get polymer type. Um, so knowing the color can definitely kind of be an indicator of what we might be looking at. Um, a true far way to know the source and type of um, plastic is to actually determine the polymer base, um, which would key us in um, as researchers more into what the plastic may have originated from or how it may have entered the environment. Um, I've read some papers in that um, ghost fishing gear within um, a lot of these coastal areas here, especially here in Alaska too, um, is a big culprit to these plastic fibers, um, which makes sense based on the, um, the way that the fishing gear is, is constructed and used. It would slough off in fibers a lot of the time. Um, and with black being the most common color, I think, I think that that would be, without knowing, you know, actual polymer type would be a reasonable conclusion or a reasonable thought at least. All right. Thanks, Alex. That was great. Thanks, yeah, that's that's something to think about too. I mean, the whole this whole thing is something to think about, really wrap our heads around because it seems so everywhere, like our laundry, mm -hmm. fishing equipment, right? I'm curious as to the beer one too, I have to say. Um, and then also, Sue Moore says, you mentioned continued monitoring in your conclusions. What would you monitor? Fish, seals, and how? Um, yeah, so a lot of studies have been done on fish. And, um, you know, th those are rather easy to study just because of their easily accessible, um, you know, in all different regions. And so they are finding them quite consistently um, in, in fish, both within the gill rakers of the fish as well as the stomach. Um, so I think we've kind of, as researchers, you know, we've probably gotten a, a decent understanding on that. I think that now would be the time to start looking more at these um, higher trophic level animals, such as seals and, and whales and, and walruses and things like that. Um, but not just looking at whether or not they're eating them. We know they're eating them. What we need to know is, um, is, is it being absorbed into the body? Is it being taken in? Is it accumulating or is it temporary? 
um, all of these questions will help us to better understand the problem and um, and what effects could come from that, as well as how to mitigate it. You know, the more you know, um, the more you can change. And I think um, the next step is definitely looking at that possible accumulation if it's there um, and uh, what we might learn from that. Well done, thank you. And Dakota Holly says, would it be worth looking into the composition of the microplastics? I think it would. I am for anybody doing or thinking about doing microplastics work. I think looking at the polymer um, is something very worthwhile doing because they um, the thing about microplastics studies is that it's a rather new study. Um, it's kind of a hot topic. It's being researched quite frequently now, but there hasn't been a lot of standardization in the methods and protocols that are being used. And so that means that a lot of these papers that are coming out are not reporting things consistently. But if researchers are taking the time to identify the polymer, if they have access to the equipment needed to do that, as well as color, we can identify trends. So, you know, there's certain polymers um, that are more common for textiles versus fishing gear. And if we could kind of narrow down on um, certain pieces of plastic or sources of plastic that are problematic with certain regions, we could look at possibly mitigating their entry into that environment, uh, figuring out ways to engineer a way and engineer a solution there. Um, so I think knowing polymers can definitely paint more of that picture to understanding how to stop it. All right. Um, Monica Brandhuber says, any thoughts on, or asks, any thoughts on future research, including nanoplastics less than five nanometers? Great presentation. Any thoughts yeah. on future research on that? I, I haven't seen a whole lot on nanoplastics um, research. Um, that is uh, that's a tough one. Um, oh, you didn't mean nanoplastics? Nanoplastics. Okay. Um, yeah, nanoplastics are just so challenging because um, they require a lot of care in order to not contaminate that samples um, and to actually detect it um, requires a, a lot of dedication. Yeah, she says wrong unit by me. Okay, got it. So you were right on. Um, and did, did that answer the question? That was Monica. Good. Okay. And then Valentina asks to understand whether it is retained or absorbed. Are you considering looking at plastic content in fecal samples? Has this sample type been explored for this analysis to your knowledge? Yes. Um, so I know that um, not necessarily for marine mammals, but I know, well, for some marine mammals, they have looked at feces. Um, for instance, they looked at the feces of northern fur seals and killer whales off the coast of um, California, and then the resident killer whale population in um, southern Alaska, northern um, Washington area, and they found microplastics in the feces, which can be a good thing because, right, it means that they're excreting these microplastics, you know, they're eat eating it, but they're getting rid of it. Um, the problem with um, excreting microplastics in the water is that you've just reintroduced that contaminant back into the water column and it can be ingested again by somebody else. Um, so it's kind of a, a, a very vicious and awful cycle in the ocean. Um, and then, uh, but whether or not that's the same number that gets excreted or versus absorbed um, is to be determined. Um, so feces are definitely something that are being looked at, especially for marine mammals, because um, I was very fortunate to be able to use uh, tissues from subsistence harvested seals, um, which allowed um, a, an insight into an otherwise healthy population, right? A lot of uh, marine mammals that are being studied for microplastics are stranded animals you know, worldwide because that's all they can access without harming the population. And a stranded animal is often sick. They often don't have prey in their stomach. So it's really hard to determine um, how much or if any microplastics may have contributed to their, their overall health. Um, but we do collect feces here at Fish and Game for um, HABs work and other things. Um, so it could be something that um, is looked at in the future, um, but it doesn't really tell us at the end of the day, you know, how much is actually being absorbed into the tissues. And that's where Laura comes in um, and, and her uh, undergraduate that she's working with and looking at actual muscle and tissue samples to see if this is being absorbed um, after it's ingested. Um, so definitely many avenues there. So, so this is my question. One of my questions, I don't know much on this, the, the chemistry of this topic, but could, is it something where you could take a blood sample 
you know, there's a lot of people doing live capture and things like that. Can you take a, or even from harvested animals, can you take a blood sample and look at the chemistry to determine, do we have baseline and then kind of a way to look at plastic chemicals? Yeah, um, there's yeah. definitely, I, I don't know of any studies off the top of my head, but I wouldn't, I don't see why it wouldn't be possible. Um, there's a researcher, Dr. Fossey, who's actually looked at a lot of these mar um, chemical markers that you were talking about. These, um, there's a couple and they're really long chemical names. I don't remember what they actually are, but it's DEPH and MEPH. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. Uh, these, uh, they're finding in the blubbers of, um, blubber of uh, various sharks and whales. And these markers actually tell them that there is um, evidence of persistent bioaccumulative toxins, which includes a lot of those ones that are used in plastic manufacturing. So there is a way to tell that chemically um, through through methods like that. But I also, you know, I one of the things I was thinking about when I was working on this project is that if it can mimic the or affect the endocrine system and affect the hormones of these animals. Um, as it passes through that stomach lining, potentially you know, absorbed into the body, you know, as it it could potentially be distributed throughout the animal through the lymphatic system or maybe even the circulatory system and deposit these plastics in the different tissues. So I wonder almost if we could see microplastics in a blood sample. And I, I don't, it's just, just wondering, and you know, it's definitely something that we could look at and it would be something that would be easier to access in a lot of these cases right. just to see what we see for sure. Right. All right. Um, and then from me, I, I had the, the, question when you have the pollock being consumed so the seals and this may get at your tissue issue tissue issue the the seal spotted seal is eating pollock and 85 percent of the pollock something like that have plastics so two questions are they getting the microplastic i guess they're getting the microplastics from the stomach of the pollock right or but the gill breakers yeah okay but we wouldn't know if there's a chemical buildup right? right that would then be worse because they're ingesting not just the plastics but they're the whole thing of it is they want to get that meat and and, and organs and stuff so uh, well this is cheering a <laughs> cheery it's like a cyclical topic i see this and so um so if i shoot a spotted seal but i don't want to eat my credit card worth of plastic don't eat this don't eat the out of the stomach don't eat what's ever in the stomach and toss the stomach i guess would that be advisable if you don't want to get plastics but then the chemistry we don't know is that what right you're hearing? right we don't and know if the chemistry is affecting the muscle tissue the stomach tissue the intestines things like that right and okay. and this is the thing is, is we don't know we don't know you know, the overall health effects. We don't know if it's moved its way through other parts of the seal. Um, the only thing we do know is that it hasn't changed. Um, the levels haven't changed since 2012. They've been rather consistent. Um, yeah. And there's been so many studies out there um, with um, microplastics in, in so many different human sources um, that you could be exposed to, you know, just as easily or if not uh, more easily um you know drinking bottled water is the number one culprit right you know those plastics leach off the, the bottle into the water um just examples like that they're finding them and mcdonald's chicken nuggets are loaded with them you know they're, they're just they're a very ubiquitous contaminant um so I, you know i don't really have any advice on not eating uh, the stomach versus eating the stomach yeah. um but um no you're yeah. giving me a good answer and i appreciate right. that that is helpful we just don't know on the chemistry side of the house i'm thinking yeah. if you don't want that in your meal you know we have to that's a uh that's an issue so thank you right. um dean i see you got your hand up go ahead all right dean i see your hand up but if you Maybe that was an accidental bump. There is a question in the chat from Tony Blade. Hey, Alex, you mentioned earlier in the talk how microplastics can accumulate into larger groups in, in the ocean. Did you have any hint of this happening within stomachs? Were there aggregations of fibers and fra fragments? Um, great question, Tony. Um, unfortunately, it's it's really hard to tell. Um, the from start to finish, the the contents were so agitated um, all the time. 
um, as they, you know, we see them through a couple of times, they're moving around there, um, getting broken up, then they're freeze dried and moved around as the moisture is extracted. And then the whole time they're in the incubator, I had them on a rocking platform. So the samples were constantly moving back and forth to kind of increase the ability of the chemical enzymes to actually break down the tissue. Um, so the samples were rather in motion. So I think that limited um, a lot of the possibilities for aggreg aggregation. And then again, vacuum filtering, they just kind of all go through on that filter and uh, they lie where they lie, so to speak. Um, I didn't really see anything on there. I think I saw one point where there was two fibers kind of stacked on top of each other, but it could have just been an artifact of how the um, fiber settled onto the fiber and not actually clumped together in the, in the stomach themselves. All right, and Laura, I see you, Dean, we'll come around. Um, Laura says, just a fun fact. Oh dear, human feces contains up to 50 microplastics per gram. For gray whales, it's four. And bowheads, it's up to six so far, all sub-adults. So we're winning the race in plastics, in donating back to the environment, I would I would say. And Laura, you know, you're going to be back here for straight science with the bowhead uh, microplastic results. That definitely, we'd love to hear more about that. So okay. um, Dean... And that was a an interesting fact. Dean Stockwell, I see you had your hand up. Are you are you back? Do you have a question? Okay, no worries. All right. And I would say the most unexpected part of your talk was the tap water. You have to watch out for microplastics in the tap water of Fairbanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we originally started just using the regular laboratory water um, out of the faucet. Um, and then I was just planning on running a, a water sample through a filter just so I could see how much was there and background subtract it. And I was alarmed at the amount of plastics on that filter just from one, one cycle of filtering. Um, and so I knew that I needed to reassess um, how I went about this process in order to prevent contaminating the samples with extra plastics. Um, and uh, so that's why we had to pre-filter all the water to use. And so anytime that we um, handle the sample, whether it was with forceps or glass stirring rods, or just, in, you know, actually rinsing them through the sieves, um, we had to use this filtered water so that we didn't add more plastics to the samples. I just think about baby formula or your pets or, uh, you know, at an early age, children, right? At the earliest mm -hmm. age. Yeah, That's absolutely. A long life of microplastics at a very early start. So, Interesting. Very interesting presentation. You gave it quite well. Any other questions? Oh, oh Dean, I can't hear you. I see you. Yeah, I, I, Dean's trying to get through on the side. It it does look like you were unmuted, at least to me. So do you want to type in your question? While Dean is maybe typing in his question, um, next week at this time, same on the 7th of December, we're going to have a talk, a speaker from the Marine Mammal Institute of Oregon State University, and they're going to be talking about bowhead timing, uh, timing changes of the migration. So bowhead migration, we'll be sending those notices out. Um, this person has been doing a lot of uh, underwater call work with acoustic microphones underwater that have been stationed in places and the whales are are swimming past or not calling. And um, she's looking at the changes. It's really appropriate because right now we are very delayed in our ice or you know, we are delayed in our ice coming down and our ice formation at this time. And I believe I heard of somebody seeing a bowhead very recently. I think one of the first um, off the North shore of St. Lawrence Island recently, and people still are seeing many of the summer whales. So uh, humpback whales, uh, gray whales, that kind of thing. People are reporting all the way up to diamede actually. So those, uh, this call, I mean, this presentation next week will be very interested for those who are waiting for the bowhead. And um, we'll hear more about what the science world from the calls has to say about changes in bowhead whale timing. Okay, Dean, I don't see anything. I know, I'm sorry, for some reason, we're not able to connect on this. Hello. Hello, hello, hello caller, go ahead. Hi, hi. Yeah, my name is Morris, the Sornatime, and you pick from Stebbins, 
in the northern San Diego. And uh, I've got uh, a couple of questions, you know, at the beginning, which I've heard uh, Carl with the microplastic uh, were found in the spotter seal. Uh, my question is, uh, how were the animals uh, or the seals uh, captured to, to make the study possible? Yeah, that's a good question. So the spotted seals from the study were actually harvested by the native hunters on um, Gamble and Shishmara, and they provided the samples to the Department of Fish and Game here in Fairbanks. And I used the samples to not only um, do the diet analysis, which is what they were sent for, but also look for microplastics. So these were just subsistence harvested spotted seals. Okay, thank you. Uh, the microplastic, you know, is is pretty much a worldwide. Yeah, I've, I've seen some studies in within the Atlantic and many other oceans. And uh, one other question is that you know, having studied these body seals, the, the other animals, uh, mammals, uh, like the belugas, and also the ring seal. Uh, I like at least some information on the belugas because they're the Norton found stock, you know, maybe that, you know, they went out, out in the ice free areas and move in during, during the springtime during the herring fish run. And of course, you know, they stay within the um, all waters as well as the Mosa Yukon. And uh, is there a possible chance of looking into, if any, I'm sure belugas as well as the ring seal may have this. Um, uh, foreign pot and uh, uh, microplastic in their stomachs as well. Yeah. Um, so let me just make sure that I got the question right. You're just um, wondering about the possibility of looking at um, beluga stomachs and, and ring seals and other species for, for microplastics? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, it, it, I would I would love for for somebody to to look at those species. Um, I know that they're um, very important subsistence species for a lot of communities. Um, and uh, with the beluga whale stock, especially, you know, um, potentially changing in the size, is definitely something to look at. Um, I think that um, a good avenue for that would be through the um, Alaska Beluga Whale Commission, her committee, um, and actually bringing that up and seeing if a project can get put together to look at beluga stomachs um, and as, as well as seals with the ice seal committee. I think those are, are great platforms. I don't know of anybody else looking at those two species at the moment. I know Lara Horseman at UAF is looking at bowhead whale stomachs, and I believe there's some work being done on walruses. Um, but I don't know of any um, specifically right now for beluga or ring seal. And that's not to say that they shouldn't be done. Um, and I think it should definitely be brought up and, and, and explored for sure. Yeah, thank you. I think with the concern, you know, you pretty much a highlight of what the, uh, the animals are eating right now or the waste of the human there, or the micro mm -hmm. um, plastic. And, and uh, I depended on the resources for many generations, you know. Uh, my family has, you know, passed down to generations and grew up in along the shores of Norton Sound and have depended on the uh, uh, new resources like you know, and seals and belugas and walrus. And, and uh, of course, you know, later on, we probably look into the other possible intrusions like the Northwest Passage will be Probably a big deal sometime later because of the, I'm sure the traps and waste out of those ships as well. And uh, I just said uh, during the year time where someone had mentioned the ice conditions has totally you know, changed quite you know dramatically within a few years and and of course it affected the seals all the subsistence uh, gathering as a pretty much interrupted by the. Uh, Thing over the ice as well as the not as many abundant seals as we see, and uh, the other one is the um, the major river drainage. Uh, many communities in the Yukon, uh, plastic is a, a form that you know, mark, mark people, mark many other stuff you need that 
they say water source, water containers, pops, or whatever, then it gets broken down to the landfill. Of course, you know, many doesn't get to the landfill as well. So uh, we have many uh, debris uh, come down to Yukon as well as you test the and it gets into our, our shores uh, in the Northern Sound area. So. Morris, this is uh, this is Gay Sheffield. Thank you so much for your thoughts on Beluga and Ring Seal. Um, do you have a pencil with you to write down a number? Okay, hold on. Let me get work. Okay. Okay, go on. So the ice seal, uh, Alex gave good uh, advice. The ice seal committee, that's a, a committee, a co-management group for um, the federal government and um, tribal governments of and representatives from the region. And our representative that I would give a call and and say, hey, why are we not getting Beluga and um, Ring Seal? What do we have to do to get them tested or whatever else you'd like tested? His name is Chuck Manadluk. And Chuck. his, yep, he's the subsistence director at Querick. And his number is 907-443-4265. And so he'll be able to bring that message to the ICE SEAL committee. Um, and okay. and then they'll talk to the NOAA and they're in charge of SEALs. And that's a good way to, um, I see you, Laura, hang on. And that's a good way to get that message across. So thank you, Alex, and thank you, Morris. For the Beluga Whale Committee, that would be Tom Gray. Are you familiar with, with Tom Gray? I don't have his phone number. Yes, uh, yes, okay. I, uh, yeah, I know Tom Gray pretty well. So, yep, yeah. he would be a good one to ask uh, same thing regarding Beluga because he's in charge of the okay. Beluga Whale uh, Committee. Okay. And there's a lot of representation from Eastern Norton Sound in the Beluga Whale Committee, so that's good. So thank you. you bet. Thank you for calling in. Laura, go ahead. So, so Morris, thank you for that, because I have actually asked for um, beluga tissues and uh, beluga stomach contents to look for microplastics. So, so this would very much help if you, if you could, you know, bring this to these committees and, um, and ask them to look into this. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. We'll see you next week when we learn more about bowhead um, timing changes in the migration. And um, Alex, I'm afraid to eat my dinner. I don't know <laughs> what to do. I'll probably have a, have a credit card. Uh, maybe I'll nibble on that with some ketchup. But anyway, thank you so much. Very mind uh, mind expanding. I got a lot of thoughts on um, on the topic of microplastics. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure to speak with everyone today.